So I'm going to introduce my boss now. He's a great guy. He's wearing a really nice tie today. Uh, Please welcome Frank Thanks very much, and uh, uh, I think the Pack House really does demonstrate the, the sort of high level of interest in, uh, in these issues at the moment. I, I just thought, Eric, because it didn't come up in your introduction, I, I don't know whether this is useful to Twitter people, but I started a couple of tweets there while David was talking. Uh, 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 finding a hashtag. Uh, that we can all agree on is one of the uh, challenges of these sorts of conferences early, I thought. So uh, it seems to me that that's a, a, a hashtag that's been used since uh, January. So, um, so if we you know, have a Twitter conversation, we might have it there. And I would uh, join others in acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the land on which we gather. Uh, and those who come to the roads proceed to the experience of, of mental illness. I was asked to uh, reflect a little sandwich as I am between David Butt, who is going to solve all the problems uh, that we've uh, had in relation to the health and broad system. Uh, Eddie Bartnick, who's going to solve all the problems that we've had in relation to uh, mental health within the NDIS. Um, Nick Hartman, who uh, designed many of the aspects of, uh, of the NDIS. I might say uh, very justifiably my public service medal for doing so. Um, Indigo and others who are going to share uh, a, a bit about uh, uh, some of the experience. I thought I'd really concentrate on just trying to reflect on where the NDIS sits within a much broader uh, reform agenda and share some of my reflections really on some of the issues uh, as we face them. Some of that means revisiting a little bit of history, um, but as I look at the program, there are plenty of people who are going to talk. Uh, with much more knowledge than I would have about some of the things that are actually happening in the implementation sites and others. So hopefully that's uh, going to be a useful uh, reflection to just start our, uh, our proceedings off. My, uh, anyone who's heard me talk any time in the last 12 months before has seen me use this slide, and I, I apologise for that. Uh, except that I think it, it really does capture a sense of uh, some of the despair and hopelessness around the challenge of mental health reform as we've seen it over and over. I took this photo outside the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Canberra only a couple of years ago. And I think it captures for me the sort of desperate sense that we've had so much hope for mental health reform for so long, and yet we've struggled to realise that. So much so that when uh, John Mendoza prepared his report last year, he suggested we were suffering an obsessive hope disorder, was how, how he described it, because there had been so much uh, hope put into uh, all of these review uh, processes. But nonetheless, there, you know, there are a range of uh, issues that are affecting us at the Commonwealth level, a range of issues that are going to have a direct bearing on uh, the work that we're doing in the mental health space. And I tend to be an optimist. I tend to think that we're progressively and incrementally marching forward and that we've got to uh, just wrestle with the complexity and the, and the challenges uh, that we face. Uh, so I, I want to just touch on a little bit of that uh, history as I talked about, because uh, people who were involved in the advocacy, and some of them are uh, in the room, and um, some of them talk, but some of them are not. Some of them who were involved in the advocacy around the National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, will recall it wasn't an easy path for um, necessarily for mental health, and I think that's part of the challenge that we uh, face now. It's not a new, uh, it's not a new issue. It's been a long time coming. So there were calls in the National Health Strategy in '93 and, and well before that about continuity of care for people with chronic mental illness. Uh, we had in 2011, uh, I'd like to describe it as a landmark, um, sorry, I've seen across the picture there. It doesn't seem to have come up, I don't know if that's a... Uh, it's not on your... No. Screen? Okay, sorry, I apologise for that. I'll skip on what, what I was saying was what, what that picture so adequately describes. <laughs> I, hope, I, I hope my later pictures come up because I'll, I'll, I'll pitch my whole story around a couple of pictures later on. Uh, that, that was meant to be the, the cover of a document called Unraveling Psychosocial Disability, which was prepared by the National Consumer Carer uh, Forum, National Mental Health Consumer Carer Forum and I think uh, really crystallised uh, a range of discussion at the time uh, around what psychosocial disability was 
uh, allowed us then to have a conversation about why that ought to be included in the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme. And still, I think, gives us some considerable guidance about uh, what it is that we're talking about. I noticed in our title, and, and I often slip into the same uh, error, that we use the notion of mental health and psychosocial disability interchangeably. And of course they're not, and I think that gives us uh, some of the, uh, creates some of the confusion. So just to remind ourselves of what uh, the World Health Organization and others uh, consider psychosocial disability to be, I don't know if you read, but I'll hold. The interaction of long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, and attitudinal or environmental barriers that hinder full and effective participation. That's a very broad definition. It moves us a long way from the idea that we can consider uh, simply a mental health diagnosis and try and decide whether that mental health diagnosis uh, or, or, or not fit within a scheme like the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I think um, we'll, we'll hear a bit more about that as, as we go on. Uh, it goes on to say, and this was uh, something from that, uh, that unravelling psychosocial disability that I talked about. It goes on to say that these impairments may range from mild to severe, commonly include difficulties with communication, cognition, planning, goal setting, and task management. Uh, a range of issues that uh, the NDIS has some capacity to provide some support on, but uh, a range of issues that the NDIS is likewise not a universal teacher for. This is not, we're not expecting that the National Disability Insurance Scheme is going to say, solve all of those issues. So one of the, the challenges that we have and that we still live with, uh, I think, is really reconciling exactly what parts of a person's experience uh, ought to be served by the NDIS, what parts ought to be served by uh, the broader mental health and other systems, and, and how we identify those, some of those issues. The other reminder as I look through the, the um, uh, documentation ahead of today that I wanted to make uh, came from the, uh, some of these slides I, I actually um, prepared at a, a forum that my in Australia ran in 2012, but I think it's helpful again uh, to reflect back on, uh, because I think some of the challenges are still so uh, important to us. Uh, it's important to say the NDIS, not the NIDS, the NDIS is, uh, is an insurance model and not a service model. And again, I think sometimes we interchangeably sort of talk about the NDIS as if we're talking about a service system. And we're not. The NDIS is an insurance model. I think one of the uh, challenges that we've encountered along the way is that we tend, I think, to perhaps to find security in slipping into service design ideas rather than insurance design ideas. But nonetheless, it's important to recognise that it is an insurance scheme. And as I've said, that mental health is not psychosocial disability. They're not, uh, they're not the same thing. The other thing that we were, uh, I think, in 2012 wrestling with and still wrestling with today is that it's is this notion of tiered support and exactly what it is that occurs when somebody uh, receives a tier three package versus what it is that somebody uh, receives when they receive tier two supports. And I think we've rightly focused on uh, the implementation of tier three issues we are getting started, and I, I think that's been important. But uh, I think uh, it's as relevant today to suggest that we, we still have to manage that. The other thing that I think is important to, to recognise up front is that uh, we are still in transition. So uh, we are in a, uh, a, a build and design uh, process. Now a lot of that occurred, uh, frankly, I think, or, or, or was rushed, frankly, because of the political circumstances around the, the rushed beginning of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in the lead up to the last election. And uh, that wasn't the doing of anybody in this room, that was the, the, the sort of consequence of the, the particular political circumstances at the time. But acknowledging, I think, that we are in a rush implementation is, I think, an important part of how we might overcome some of the challenges. Of course, from the mental health sector's perspective, uh, there was a lot to be hopeful about, and there remains a lot to be hopeful about in relation to the NDIS and why uh, so many people wrestled for so long 
to ensure uh, that the uh, uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, embraced uh, many people within our existing systems. It has this fundamental uh, philosophical approach of, of maximising choice and control. And as uh, I think David was uh, hinting at in his presentation, I think that um, philosophical notion has an enormous transformative capacity across all of our services. So we'll achieve something certainly in the NDIS, but I think one of the things, if we could be five or ten years ahead and looking back, I suspect what we'll say is that the cha this change in the NDIS had an enormous impact on a whole raft of services in the uh, social and community services <coughs> space, in the psychosocial support space, because of the transformative nature of that, that shift. Uh, a, a lot like uh, the, the mental health system, the original conception of the National Disability Insurance Scheme was that there would be multiple levels of access and support, that people would have a sense of no wrong at all. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, that our current uh, uh, transitional rollout arrangements are reflecting exactly that uh, approach, uh, but nonetheless that was part of the uh, philosophy at the, at the time of design. It's also important to recognise, I think, from a mental health perspective, I think it's David Meldrum who is the person I've most heard say, talk about the 80-20 rule, that um, uh, when you look at a person's uh, broad needs, something like 20% of those needs might be clinical, something like 80% of those needs might be much broader than that, uh, broader psychosocial needs. And so the opportunity, part of the opportunity of the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme in its design phase was that it recognised that and recognised the broader supports that people uh, need, su supports that they're not getting from the clinical system. Uh, we also thought it was going to provide an opportunity for increased access uh, to community mental health, increased funding for community mental health, because that's one of the services that uh, we really <coughs> hope that people who are uh, in need of psychosocial support would be requiring. And uh, we also hoped at the time that there would be a growing and specialised workforce in the mental health space. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, mental health, like many other areas, face is that uh, recognising the uh, challenge of the, of the future in terms of engaging an expert, uh, qualified uh, team of professionals and peers who can uh, pursue the sorts of support arrangements that we need in the future. Again, going back to the uh, forum that we had in uh, 2012, some couple of years ago now, two years ago now, we identified uh, that eligibility was one of the uh, major concerns, and I think, uh, as, as we said, uh, it, it remains one of the very substantial <coughs> concerns that we have. Reflecting back on that, both the tiered nature of the scheme and the complex nature of the um, psychosocial disability that people experience, uh, working out what it means around eligibility and assessment and not falling back onto this notion that uh, what we have to do is find a diagnosis and let that diagnosis become a ticket into a scheme is one of the real challenges because at the same time, uh, a scheme like the NDAs will be unsustainable unless there is some way of teaching people uh, on, on entry into the scheme. We also identified at the time that uh, the assessment process is one of the great challenges for the same sorts of reasons as I've uh, identified uh, already. Understanding at, at the time, and I think we made this point at the time, and I would reflect that we perhaps haven't learned uh, as quickly all the lessons uh, that, that we might have, that in relation to psychosocial disability, it is probably at the time and, and remains that the community mental health sector is one of the greatest capacities to assist in that uh, assessment process and assist in the broad uh, understanding. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's not yet enough you know, information to help us still understand exactly how that uh, assessment process is going to remain eventually. But that's, uh, that's all the, the sort of history I wanted to talk about. I did want to um, briefly touch on some of the other current reforms that are affecting uh, mental health at the moment, because I think unless we're talking about the NDIS in its broader context, uh, we'll miss that important opportunity. So we have uh, the 2014 budget, which was the most recent sort of substantial in injection of um, both thinking and resources into the mental health sector. We saw big initiatives in the budget, like the Partners in Recovery program. And we're just at a stage now where a program like Partners in Recovery is coming to some sort of sense of maturity, where we're just starting to get a bit of information about uh, exactly whether, whether it's the right thing, whether it's working, whether it's not working, and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, it, 
and yet we've seen that programs like Partners in Recovery are already earmarked for um, um, uh, consolidation into the National Disability Insurance Scheme. We don't know exactly what that means completely yet, but uh, I think it's part of this uh, great challenge that we often experience in mental health that we have initiatives. Um, they might work well, they might work badly, sometimes they work well, but before the sort of life cycle really has a chance to reach maturity, we've moved on, we're moving on to, uh, moving on to something else. Uh, David Buck talked about the review of uh, mental health services and programs that the Commonwealth is conducting, and David does, yes, yeah, you just heard, is reporting to the government on Monday morning. Uh, that will no doubt have a very substantial impact on a whole raft of programs that are a part of our current um, tapestry of programs and services that support uh, people who experience mental illness and people who experience social disability. So at the same time as we're trying to nut out how we might uh, incorporate those programs and services and uh, have arrangements between them and the NDIS or absorb them into the NDIS, how that might work. At the same time as we're trying to organise those transitional arrangements, we're, we're potentially transitioning or changing uh, a whole raft of those uh, programs. We also have pro uh, reviews being conducted that are not directly related, but still nonetheless uh, important. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the McClure report is up to. Patrick McClure is reviewing uh, welfare arrangements, and I thought his report was due in October, actually, but uh, we haven't seen it yet. But nonetheless, Patrick will be making some recommendations, I would expect, not just about uh, welfare payments, which has received a lot of press, but when Patrick wrote his first report on welfare um, more than a decade ago, he rightly then observed that you can't really talk about um, the, the welfare system, you can't talk about payments, unless you talk about the whole range of services and supports that go with that. And so I would expect that report will be making some important recommendations that again, um, throw some of our transitional arrangements into the air. I know Twiggy Forest at the same time as Patrick was doing his review of <coughs> welfare, Twiggy Forest did a review of employment, yeah, Indigenous employment services, but um, wasn't necessarily constrained by his uh, terms of reference and has made a raft of recommendations about the broader welfare system uh, as well. We also have at Commonwealth level, I think this is one of the sleeping giants in the way of, um, with, in terms of potential impact on uh, mental health uh, programs, is the Federation White Paper. So the current government have invested uh, a great deal of their political capital in the notion that they're going to revisit the Federation. And as we know, uh, mental health services and programs, and frankly, uh, a raft of uh, NDIS issues, really do occur directly at the cusp of state and territory government uh, programs and federal government programs. And so this is very important. There's a, there's, a white, uh, there's a discussion paper out already. There's soon to be a, uh, a discussion paper on health uh, and health-related issues. I think that's due uh, before Christmas. Uh, I think this process over the coming uh, 12 or 18 months, frankly, in the lead up to uh, an election that uh, the coalition will be prosecuting, uh, I think is a very important program, uh, process. And any of us who have an interest in uh, the future of these arrangements uh, really ought to be looking, looking at that pretty closely. And then on top of that, as we're going to hear at, at length over the next couple of days, we have the, the NDAs rollout. So, uh, as, as I said, there's a whole raft of, uh, of issues that are affecting us uh, nationally. I want to um, draw David, David Butt already uh, talked about the, um, about the um, uh, metaphor of the analogy that was used by uh, reviewers who conducted a review of the uh, National Security Insurance Agency and said that it was like a, and this is where I find out whether my um, book carries with the slides or not. Um, can you see the relief on my face when I put your hands? There's the, the next few slides that are really depend on things. This is actually the cover from the a review of the report that was written on the NDIA capability. And, and I thought, in, in a sense, it was both, I, I think it's a great analogy, but I think it was a little unfair, really, that uh, it was pointed at the National Disability Insurance Agency, given what I've said already about the fact that I think it was really the scheme that was uh, rushed ahead in a lot of uh, planning that might have occurred before you set up an NDIA or why you set up an NDIA at the time to So this is a picture of a famous plane that is in flight and, uh, and is under construction. 
And uh, I think the, that it's a very powerful metaphor to capture that sense of uh, sort of working while we, while we build. It's one that's close to my heart, and I won't dwell on this uh, next picture. This one's close to my heart because I fly a little one, like playing the weekends, that's my little. It's not my gazelle, it's the gazelle I, I hire, but uh, falling out of the sky is something that is, uh, is close to my heart, um, part of my mind when I get out on the weekends. Uh, but as, uh, as we've said uh, in other forums, the, the fundamental challenge, as, uh, as I said around this metaphor, is that it's not just the notion that the NDIS is a plane that's uh, under construction. It's the notion that flying alongside that uh, plane is a mental health system. And at the moment, what we're doing, and, and rightly because we, we welcome the idea, is that we're stripping parts off this plane and helping to build this one. And while we're doing that, it's our intention eventually that this plane will keep flying and this plane will keep flying. So it's a pretty delicate sort of operation that we're really uh, addressing during this transitional phase. But as Josh convinced me yesterday when I was uh, testing with Josh whether I should use this uh, analogy or not extend it, uh, you might argue that it's actually worse than that. And if this um, side moves, you'll see why. <coughs> It's because at a state and territory level, there are actually a whole raft of systems that are similarly uh, in operation. They're in flight in each state and territory, all the services and programs that are delivering mental health and psychosocial supports. And at the same time as they're um, flying along, and for the most part intended to keep flying along, um, we're stripping parts off them as well. And, and I think that that really captures the sense of uh, real challenge that, that we're facing at the moment, that we have such complex systems that are, are currently underway and are intended to stay underway, but are nonetheless uh, in the midst of very, very substantial reform. Uh, what that means is that if, if you can imagine the, uh, the sort of network diagram that, uh, that falls out of that last picture, what that means is that there are an enormous number of negotiations occurring between uh, governments, uh, but also, as you can imagine, governments are negotiating with themselves. So we've got to get help to talk to social services and to talk to the employment uh, age. All, all of those are occurring at the same time. At the same time, uh, the sector is trying to negotiate, negotiate with those same uh, governments and negotiating with, within the portfolios within those governments. So the sort of governance challenge that we have at the moment is enormous. Arguably, I think it's fair to say that COAG is the ultimate arbiter because the National Disability Insurance Scheme is ultimately an agreed program of the Commonwealth uh, and the states. But COAG is a very cumbersome and slow-moving beast, I have to say, and is not really um, set up or, in, or intended to deal with the complexity of these, you know, I think very challenging uh, implementation issues. The other challenge that we have in that space, of course, is that the um, uh, sector has no standing at the current table. And so uh, our uh, engagement with various parts of the process often feels like we're, we're sort of boxing at shadows or leaping at opportunities. It's very difficult, I think, for us to process one minute. Oh, um, that's the advantage of being Josh's boss. He can't really shut me <laughs> um, the, um, uh, the sector has no standing or no clear standing at those tables. And I think one of the things we're going to say about the Federation White Paper process is that it be just about governments. And one of the things I think we need to say in the co process, and that's one of the things we said in this forum about 12 months ago when we got together, is that co will not just be about, uh, about governments. Uh, I will skip, skip through the end because I, I really just wanted to draw attention to the fact that we uh, have, in response to this vast complexity, pr produced a seven point plan for mental health reform. And some of you will have seen that. We've certainly done some. Uh, work on that uh, publicly over the last little, little while. And we've, what we've tried to do is really articulate what it is that we think uh, the, uh, we need in the current uh, context. And if I could summarise uh, 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 briefly, I think you'll, you'll get the sense that my summary carries over to the NDIS. Uh, uh, this, this is our plan for the, for the broad mental health system. We said, uh, I'll, I'll pick three things off this list. We said that we should first and foremost agree what it is that we want to achieve. 
uh, and be clear about who's responsible for what. I think that's that's a fundamental, and I think that's the challenge that we're uh, incrementally uh, beavering away at in the um, NDO space. And we also said that we ought to increase consumer and carer uh, participation and choice in those processes. And I, I think it's still a bit challenging to, to see how uh, that we've actively uh, and adequately engaged with consumers and carers in some of these, these issues. Not for want of trying, but I, I think that the complexity means that we're all uh, struggling with that. I want to finish with just a, a brief story that I think captures the sense of, of where it is that um, perhaps we're, we're feeling at the moment, or certainly that I, I felt about it at the moment, um, uh, about where we are in terms of these, uh, these negotiations. And the story is told uh, actually by, uh, or is attributed to uh, somebody who was telling a, a, a story about um, some American missionaries who had visited a little uh, African village. And it's told by the villager. And the, the story some of you may have heard, it's about an elephant and a mouse dancing together. And I'll just, uh, I'll just read, the, um, I'll read the brief story because I think it captures the, the sense of, of where it is about to. Uh, the elephant and the mouse were the best of friends. And one day, the elephant said to the mouse, Mouse, let's have a party. The animals gathered together from near and far, and they ate and they drank and they sang, and they danced, and nobody celebrated harder than the elephant and the mouse. After the party was over, the elephant exclaimed, Mouse, did you ever go to a better party? What a blast. But the mouse did not answer. Mouse, where are you? The elephant called. He looked around at his friend and then shrank back. There, at the elephant's feet, lay the mouse, his little body crushed and broken in the dirt. He'd been smashed by the feet of his dancing and exuberant friend, the elephant. As we've uh, talked about uh, these issues, the uh, challenge that I, I, I think I settled on that story is that we do feel a little like we're dancing with an elephant. And the elephant is our friend. We uh, were amongst the strongest advocates for the introduction of uh, a national disability insurance scheme that embraced psychosocial disability. But the NDIS is a much bigger beast than a little bit of the, the space that we're working on. And uh, I think the challenge that we have in, in wrestling and dancing with this, uh, with this beast is, uh, remains one of the great uh, challenges that we face at the moment. It's not for any intention, it's not for uh, it's not for any negligence, it's just that we're dealing with a very big and complicated thing. And I'm really hopeful that over the course of the next couple of days, we're going to have an opportunity to work through uh, precisely some of those uh, challenges because I think ultimately the challenge of complexity is to break down the challenges one by one and to make the problems smaller and solvable uh, rather than large and threatening.